Okay, looks like it's six o'clock, so I'll go ahead and get us uh, kicked off and started here. Um, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, and welcome to our panel discussion uh, this evening on changing expectations in today's workforce, kind of as it relates to, to DE&I. Um, my name is Jen Kapesnika, and I am the manager of the National Council on Administrative Fellowships. Uh, so on behalf of NCAF and NCHL, I want to thank you all for joining today's panel. Uh, I'm really excited for these panelists to be able to share their perspectives and uh, give some insight um, on the expertise that they that they all hold. Um, so this evening we do have a Q&A open, so feel free to, to drop your questions in there as, as we go throughout the uh, panel discussion this evening. And then we have some time set aside at the end as well for, for some, some designated Q&A time. Our event also consists of a networking session after the panel discussion this evening, and a link to that will be included in the chat, and you should have received that as well with your registration. Um, but with that, I will turn things over to Sarah Cave, the DEI Work Group Chair. Thank you, Jen. Um, so my name is Sarah Cave, and I am an associate teaching professor and the senior director for the programs in health management and informatics at the University of Washington. And I am also a member of a very special group that uh, NCHL uh, organized called GEMLENS, and it's the, it stands for the Graduate Education and Health Management Leadership Excellence Network. Um, our purpose is to collaboratively and rapidly identify, develop, implement, evaluate, and share innovative approaches to excellence in graduate health management program administration um, with a focus on program operations, alumni engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and career trajectory. And the GEMLENS group has a number of different work groups including a work group specifically centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the purpose of that work group, which I have been chairing, is to collaboratively pursue greater diversity of early careerists entering the healthcare management profession through sharing data and best practices in pipeline programs and related activities. I want to really thank uh, today uh, Jen for uh, staffing our group so capably and providing a lot of leadership and guidance um, as we've embarked on planning this event. And I also want to thank those who've been the most uh, steadfast participants in our DEI work group. And that is uh, Gwen Archibald from the University of Iowa, Sue Boren from the University of Missouri, Ed Schumacher from Trinity University, and then of course, uh, myself and Jen. I'm really pleased that we are today welcoming a number of alums from across our programs and uh, they will be introduced here shortly. Um, and before, before that, however, we are also delighted to have uh, a moderator who brings just a wealth of experience and an incredible background um, to his work. Nathan Ziegler. Um, doc, Dr. Nathan Ziegler is System Vice President for Diversity, Leadership, and Performance Excellence at Common Spirit Health, where he supports the Health Equity Blueprint for Action and leads strategic initiatives aimed at achieving equitable health outcomes for all people. He also serves as chair for NCHL's LENS DEI Council, so that's the counterpart equivalent to our GEMLENS group. And as a committee member on the Northwest Ohio Hospital Anti-Racism Project. Previously, Dr. Ziegler served as Vice President of Culture and Inclusion for Bon Secours, Mercy Health, Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Cincinnati Waldorf School, and Director of Diversity, Inclusion, Equity, and Access for South Dakota State University. He was also the founding director for the English Language and Culture Institute for South Dakota State University and a founding faculty member for the Daegu English Village in South Korea. 
Nathan has been published in international peer-reviewed journals and has spoken at more than 40 international and national conferences. In 2021, the Catholic Media Association awarded Nathan the first place prize for best reporting on social justice issues, dignity and rights of workers for his article, I Don't Want That Doctor to See Me, Responding to Bias and Racism from Patients. Nathan earned his PhD in educational psychology from the University of Toledo in 2015, as well as a master's in English in 2007 and a bachelor's in Spanish in 2004. He currently resides in Toledo, Ohio with his wife, Jen, and their four children. So it is an absolute uh, honor and delight to, uh, to welcome all of you here today and to introduce Nathan, who will moderate our expert panel. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Jen. Um, I am really excited to be here with all of you and with this outstanding panel that we have. Here with us today. We have a number of questions that we want to jump into that really explore diversity, equity, and inclusion within the workforce and in the workplace and in healthcare. Before we jump into that, I would like we will have the panelists each introduce themselves and tell us uh, why they are engaged in the work and uh, how the topic of today's panel Changing Expectations, DEI in the Workforce resonates with their careers. I will start with Kian Callender and have him introduce himself and then we'll, we'll call on the next panelist and we'll go around the room. Kian. Um, good evening or, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Kian Callender. I serve as the Health Equity Strategy and Analytics Manager as well as the Director of Early um, Talent Programs at Hartford Healthcare, a health system within uh, the state of Connecticut. Um, I'm a alum of the University of Michigan's Health Management and Policy um, Program. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here this evening. And um, you know, just at a high level in terms of um, you know, how, how this really resonates um, with me and my my journey within the DEI space very briefly, um, it's really shaped and informed by, um, by my lived experience and, and more so um, when I joined uh, the workforce, um, not being directly in the DEI space. Um, and, and just seeing um, injustices, um, either um, you know, personally or, or hearing about them, and wanting to do more, wanting to change um, the status quo. And when it, it came time for my organization to um, create a health equity and diversity and inclusion department, I, I jumped at the opportunity because I saw the need um, within the organization and um, you know, really had the passion for uh, this work. Um, so certainly happy to take a deeper dive into um, into my journey in, in terms of um, my growth and trajectory within the DEI space um, during this evening's panel. Thank you, Kian. It's great to have you here. Next, we'll call on Maria Kim. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Kim. I'm the manager of recruiting and workforce planning at UW Medicine here in the Seattle area a large academic health system in the Pacific Northwest and um, with a group of uh, medical centers and um, school of medicine um, as part of the University of Washington. Um, so my, my personal story um, and my lived experiences really uh, drew me to the eDNA efforts when it comes to the many different individuals throughout my two decades in the space of recruiting and talent acquisition, being able to support them in their career trajectory whether they started out in the front lines to moving into management and leadership roles. Um, my role today, I've spent quite a bit of time with our executives and our EDI leaders of really being able to bring all the different aspects when it comes to individuals and where meeting them where they are and supporting them in their growth uh, and also creating easier access points when we think about career pipeline development. So looking forward to uh, the panel discussions today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Maria. Next, I'll ask Michael Whittier. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Whittier. I serve as the Director of Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UCLA Health. Uh, I, my pronouns are he, him, his, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, I am a graduate of University of Missouri, uh, Columbia uh, MHA program, and uh, just a real honor to be a part of a, such an esteemed panel. Uh, and, and just to, to open up and answer a question, I, I think what we'll find is a lot of similarities in what brings us to this work, uh, our lived experiences and what uh, personally draws us to this work, uh, the conviction we have uh, in that and the purpose that's derived from those experiences. Uh, and for me, there is uh, nothing less and nothing short of that. Uh, I have seen health inequities play out um, so many ways in my family. Uh, and so thinking about ways and opportunities to drive equity in health systems, what better way than to create an equitable workforce, create equitable representation across leadership uh, and be a part of that change. Uh, and so that's what really uh, drove me to do this work. Uh, I think that's really what drives me day in, day out to both serve our staff and our, our patients, which uh, ultimately represents our community. Uh, and, and that's what really excites me about getting up every day. And so I'm uh, more than excited to, to share that wisdom uh, and, and be a part of the panel and today's discussion with all of you. Thank you, Michael. Next, we'll have BJ Patel introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is BJ Patel. I'm a senior director at uh, Ernst & Young Parthenon, which is our strategy and transactions practice that focus in health and life sciences, um, specifically around mergers and acquisitions. Um, I'm an alumni of Trinity University, and I uh, support the national level at our LGBT ERG. Um, in local level, um, I lead all the DEI efforts for EY Parthenon, um, and I sit on our Dallas DEI um, Council. And what really resonates with me is, you know, building connections through leveraging my diversity and advocating for equity in the workspace and really learn about others' backgrounds to help me understand and, and be a better leader. Uh, you know, the work environment is becoming more global, especially the work that we do. Um, and healthcare is a servicer of all types of, um, of all white walks of life. So, and then uh, to couple that, like transparency and data are becoming more and more available. So that's necessitating, you know, greater empathy and understanding of how we can relate to our patients. Um, and so there is a need for us to um, have diverse, equitable and inclusive workforce um, so we can accommodate those, the changes and, and the demands of our patient population. Um, and then, you know, within EY, our commodity are people, right? Um, we bring our brain power to the table to, um, uh, with, our, with our clients. And so we have to provide a work environment that's conducive to those different type of, types of working styles, but then also an ability to relate to our clients and, and uh, help them uh, overcome, you know, their issues or, or what their needs are. So um, that's kind of, uh, that's a lot of the reasons that drive me, drives me into uh, working in the DEI space. Thank you, VJ. Uh, what what wonderful uh, leaders we have with us today, and I'm really excited to jump into some of these questions and to get their thoughts and, and leadership around these topics. I'm going to start with a question around professionalism for you, Maria. Uh, given your your work in recruiting and talent acquisition, what does professionalism look like in your organization? Professionalism for, for UW Medicine, I would see that as part of our service culture guidelines. So really looking at it from the aspect of respect and compassion, um, embracing diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, the collaboration, the teamwork, uh, bringing innovation and accountability for excellence. Um, this is what we, uh, what we use as far as our screening uh, for our candidates, whether you're coming in a leadership role, um, thinking about your advancement opportunities, your performance evaluation, but also really bring that culture to the team, not just for our, our, our patient care needs, but also for each other as we see uh, ourselves as our customers and our, our, our colleagues as well. So that's what I would see as professionalism and really being, being able to bring that back to uh, what are the performance expectations when it comes to the individuals in the organization. 
making that a priority. So how do you take that and how do you apply a cross-cultural lens to that so that we embrace different ways of being professional? Mm -hmm. One of the most important things that we did launch uh, several years ago is with our a local and our health system, our equity, diversity, and inclusion councils and committees, really bringing representatives from a diverse uh, discipline, whether it's thinking about some of the roles in our environmental services staff, some of our roles in the direct patient care um, settings, others who are in more of the administrative settings, or even providers, being able to bring a more interdisciplinary team together. And they are representing the, the entire house um, and um, really being able to take a look at our, our service culture guidelines. What do we want to focus on and making sure that we are rounding around this, we are talking about this in all forums and also holding each other accountable, that it's really important. So if there is a deviance, let's say, away from our service culture guidelines, um, that we have an opportunity to raise and that we're empowered to raise your voices. Um, and leadership is listening and will uh, will address those and locally as well as as an organization. So it is something that in each of our meetings when we come together, whether it's employee forums or town halls, this is something that we discuss um, to make sure that this is at the forefront of what brings us together as an organization. I love that. And, you know, I, I think it, it adds a lot to really taking a dynamic approach to how we're we're being inclusive with our ideas of professionalism and really bringing people into the conversation to help define professionalism within your organization. That's really powerful. Uh, Michael, you know, I'm curious from your perspective as, uh, you know, a DEI leader at, at UCLA Health, what professional, professionalism looks like in your organization? Yeah, that's a great question, Nathan. And I think it's constantly evolving, right? As we, we look at the world around us, we look at our workforce and our workforce is constantly evolving. We have one of the most diverse workforces we'll ever have when we think about generations in one place. Uh, and so the diversity in thought, the diversity in experience, the diversity in what uh, those values are that we hold that really directs our ability to mediate conflict, to engage uh, with our team uh, and to solve problems uh, really uh, drives uh, or is the foundation to uh, what professionalism looks like. Um, I think uh, professionalism and its status quo is a, a reflection of uh, uh, racism that has been perpetuated in a corporate setting uh, because look who has defined professionalism in, in corporate America over time, right? Uh, and so uh, as that evolves, it has to reflect our values as institutions. Uh, it has to reflect our people. Uh, and so whether it's an inherent part of our organizational culture or it is explicitly spelled out, professionalism are those behavioral norms we engage with one another to uh, solve those problems, to be community with one another, to uh, drive the vision uh, and live out the values of an organization. And so uh, that's, that's the work in, in short uh, and what it really looks like for me. I love that. And um, I want to build on that. We got a really interesting question in the Q&A. How do we make uh, dress etiquette more equitable in the future entering healthcare fields or seeking uh, graduate healthcare management programs? Are dress standards like suits and ties, I love this question, equitable providing minority individuals pathways to higher roles and how can we begin to tackle that? I think that's a really interesting question. So Michael, what, what are your thoughts on that, on that particular thing around how we dress, how we show up? Um, I, I think as long as it's inclusive, right? And so thinking about uh, how religion shows up here, thinking about how uh, our LGBT community, our trans uh, communities uh, that are in our workforce have an opportunity to be a part of that solution. Uh, thinking about uh, 
uh, how sexual harassment, sexual violence is a part of this equation as well. Uh, there's a lot of intersectionality that we must consider, which really speaks to that diversity that exists uh, within our workforce. Uh, and so uh, thinking about dress uh, and thinking about how we define that, uh, I think it, it's a matter of making sure that our values are reflected in what, whatever those policies are. Uh, and so one of, one of the things that uh, really grinds my gears uh, in healthcare is this thought of dignity uh, and how health systems define it as we treat people the same regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, uh, nationality, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, that's not dignity. Uh, it, it's actually the exact opposite. It's we need to be treating people in respect of their unique differences that uh, brings that diversity into the workplace, brings those experiences that help us solve pay, uh, problems for our patients. Uh, and so when we're thinking about the policy around dress, we must center everyone in our organization. Uh, and so centering people in that policy, centering the diversity and make sure that it's inclusive. And so every, every organization will be a little bit different because the composition of those organizations will be a little different. Uh, but uh, in the, the bare minimum uh, of all those cases, we must consider that intersectionality uh, of all of the uh, different social identities that, that make up our organizations. I love that this idea of intersectionality and uh, really pulling in different dynamics and and ensuring in a way safety for individuals, uh, you know, uh, with different intersectional background identities and backgrounds. I want to kind of look at this from the other side, and this question's uh, Keon. I'd like you to to answer this one first. How do you include individuals or groups that are skeptical or hesitant of DEI in this conversation or in the work of inclusive inclusion and allyship? So, and I think there, there's a lot of complexity, um, you know, to that, and you know, just to frame it at, at a high level um, in terms of where where individuals are, uh, there are the promoters, um, those individuals who are saying this should have been done um, five years ago and I'm a champion for it. Um, there are the cooperators, the individuals um, who are just going along with whatever the organization is kind of doing. Um, and then you know the group that um, you know just you just asked about um, like to frame them as the questioners. Uh, they're not too sure. Um, they're wondering how it impacts them. And then, um, you know, for simplicity's sake, there's the fourth, the deniers, the, the people who are just like, absolutely not, there's no place um, for this. But with, with the group that's questioning, um, it's, it's approaching um, those individuals with, um, with curiosity about, um, about where they are. Um, about their understanding of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as it relates to what they do um, on a daily basis at work, but also their their lives and their, their livelihoods, recognizing that, um, you know, we all come from, um, you know, different walks of life, different experiences. And, um, and because of that, um, because of our environment, our lived environment, um, we're going to have different um, reactions or um, different ways of, of taking in um, a, a movement or a topic um, such as you know equity or justice or liberation um, in the in the workplace um, but by being curious by having conversations with those individuals and and asking why um, it it just uncovers um, so much not rushing to judgment um, in those conversations, but but really understanding and um, you know as those individuals are opening up, and I've been a part of a number of these conversations at my organization. Um, you know, connecting um, the dots and really meeting them where they're at to to uh, to show and to tell why um, equity is important and and why it's um, it's imperative for 
for them as an individual and for the organization at large um, to be focused on um, all aspects of um, DEI. Yeah, I think something you, you said you really touched on, I think a really important point, which is, uh, you know, how do we bring in people's lived experience and, and really bring them along on a journey, helping to connect the dots. Like this is a journey and not everyone's had the same lived experiences to sort of understand. It. I think that's a really powerful and, and approaching it with curiosity. I think that was another really good point that we have to start with questions and not always answers to get people to come into the con conversation. BJ, I'm curious about your perspective on this question. Uh, given that you are, you know, leading the Pride ERG, you're, you're working with clients in the health uh, care and life sciences uh, sectors. How, how do you bring people along in, in, in those regards? And how do you, we ensure that LGBTQIA population is included in, in this and, and addressing some of these things that are happening at the national level with all these bans and and new laws that are happening against the LGBTQIA population. Yeah, so for, for us, authenticity is, uh, you know, one of the themes that is paramount across all of our diversity groups. Um, and so we, the way we look at it is how can we enable individuals to come to work every single day, um, being, their, being able to be their authentic self, whether it's, you know, through speech, the way they dress, um, you know, the way they interact or the tools and, uh, you know, development opportunities that they may need to supplement um, those lived experiences. And so, um, uh, you know, to be honest, after having various um, unplugged conversations um, over the last couple of years, the common theme has been for the allies and those who could be advocates on our behalf is to speak up, right? So, um, <clears throat> so in my experience, right, um, Lately, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, news around the trans community. And we've got a number of trans individuals in our organization that have either turned over and they're from all uh, levels, all the way through partner. And, you know, about a couple of months ago, I, you know, I, I didn't know how to get involved. And I said, I reached out to a couple of trans individuals say, you know, first of all, how are you doing with all this news coming along and, you know, things in the, in the political world, um, you know, how can I help you? And what we did for, for myself, what I felt comfortable doing is providing uh, and conducting like a series um, panel sessions, whether it was through nations or internally to, to show how we as team members can support our trans individuals. And so, for, for me, you know, I felt comfortable is, um, you know, providing those outlets versus, you know, going out and being politically involved. Um, so I, I would say those who are in a position to, you know, perhaps be allies and, and can convert over to advocacy, um, reach out to those, those uh, marginalized groups to see how, you know, what they could truly uh, use. and. Honestly, most of the time, it's about speaking up and using our individual voices. Yeah, that's really powerful. I think that, you know, right now, with all the different things that are happening in society, it's important to, for allyship and, and to stand in solidarity with marginalized people. Um, and this kind of leans into our next question. And, you know, I, I want to give this one to, to you, Michael. Uh, first, how do you notice or push back on situations in the workplace that are inequitable? Yeah, I, I think this really goes back to uh, just being proactive. Uh, I, I think that uh, the most equitable organizations understand their organization top to bottom. Uh, and so, for example, we know that healthcare organizations are burnt out. Uh, there's a lot of incivilities happening between patients and staff. Uh, we know that people are growing frustrated. Uh, we also know that there's a growing intolerance of discrimination and incivility. Uh, and so with that, uh, we have to do everything that we can to constantly evaluate 
our workforce, make sure that we know uh, the pulse of our organization, understanding where our staff uh, is and uh, as it pertains to well-being, uh, that being mental, physical, emotional, we have to constantly evaluate engagement, right? Uh, and so engagement encompassing that psychological safety, uh, that psychological capacity to engage in their work, but then also, uh, which is really important nowadays, is that capacity or the psychological uh, meaningfulness as well, uh, that, that purpose being connected to the work. We know that a lot of staff just are burnt out and don't feel like their, their work is valued. They don't feel like the general public values their work. Uh, and even in a life and death type situation that we're in now. Uh, and so with that, that constant evaluation to be able to just say, hey, uh, we understand where we are. We understand what we need to do. We understand what interventions we need to put in place uh, to really better serve our people. And so uh, being proactive as possible is, is the best method uh, and the best intervention. Well, I, I want to kind of connect back to this idea of the purpose, right? Like and connecting to people's purpose and those values. And, you know, Keon, you opened up, you, you were talking about your purpose and how you came into DEI and um, you know, challenging the status quo, challenging injustice. And I'm curious how, how you approach addressing inequities within the workplace. Like what are some things or some tactics that you've been looking at within Hartford Healthcare? Um, absolutely. And um, I would say uh, calling it out and, and, and not being afraid um, to do so. Um, you know, I'm, I've been fortunate in, in my role to be in a position where that's my job. Um, but, you know, for many across the healthcare space, um, there's this inherent, um, you know, fear of retaliation. If I call it out um, in my work area, um, what will my coworkers think of me? How will I be treated? Will I be overlooked for... Um, a promotion. And, and so a lot of the, the work, as Michael was saying, with uh, psychological safety, um, ensuring there are ways um, to, to welcome that feedback, um, to, to welcome uh, colleagues across the organization to call that out. So at Hartford Healthcare, we uh, facilitated a number of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging councils uh, across the system as well as um, utilizing the, um, our virtual huddle boards um, for, um, for ideas, for feedback, um, for that information to then bubble up um, from, from the ground up and to, to address it um, head on. Um, we have um, you know, an inbox that, that I monitor and we get um, quite frequently um, emails um, with questions of how do I get involved, or um, I just went through this with my my manager and felt like um, there was there was bias or prejudice. What do I do? Um, so it, it's been you know really calling it out, addressing it head on, and and elevating um, the voices of individuals who um, who in essence have been. Um, you know, silenced over time and, and, and reassuring them that if they do speak up themselves, um, you know, they do have the support of the organization um, to do so and to, and to elevate um, issues of injustice. Yeah, and it, it seems to me like that is kind of coming back to this culture, right, that we build a culture within our organizations that is courageous, that is accepting of that type of action, right? And so there is no retaliation, there is no pushback or harm being done when someone speaks up. I think that's- And I, I would just you know, quickly add on that, one of the uh, leadership values um, at Harvard Healthcare is to have courageous conversations mm -hmm. and in others to be authentic and, and humanistic. And, and these existed before um, diversity, equity and inclusion department was, was there. Um, but we're utilizing those behaviors to drive um, a culture of equity in the organization. I love that. That's, that speaks a lot for your system in terms of 
you know, it's already holding people accountable. Now you're reframing it around DEI. And I think that will take you a long way. Um, a question came up in terms of, um, you know, how is it best as an ally? Maybe someone from a, from a dominant cultural or race or, you know, sex or gender group. How do you reach out and support people with this very nuance of not looking self-serving or being a burden on, on people that are going through an experience um, or, or looking like you're viewing people as uh, the pity? Like, how do, you, how do you show up as an ally authentically? And I'll kind of throw that to anyone on the panel who would like to take that one. I think that's a good question. I don't mind jumping on it. I, uh, I, I know we have some great panelists, and so I just want to give everybody an opportunity to speak. But uh, th this one is interesting. I, I had a, an opportunity to hear uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Bradley speak. He's a, a professor uh, at uh, the Loyola Marymount University. Uh, and this, this concept of allyship came up. Uh, and I'm, I'm all for allyship. I think it's important. Uh, I think you have to center yourself uh, and not uh, speak for someone else uh, in this. Um, I, I think that's a, a huge part of it. Uh, but with that, uh, I think we could take it a step further. I, I, I think allyship is, is really, uh, for lack of, of better terms, a glorified cheerleader. There's no skin in the game uh, uh, with allyship. Uh, and uh, the spirit of the late great uh, Honorable John Lewis, uh, I, I like an accomplice in good trouble. Uh, someone who could really say, you know, not, not only was what you said disrespectful, it was disrespectful to me. Uh, and I want to have that conversation. I want to engage because thinking of Keon's point uh, around courageous acts, right? Uh, not everyone has the words to engage in the face of discrimination, in the face of injustices in the workplace. Uh, and, and that's exhausting for people. Uh, it's mentally exhausting, it's physically exhausting. Um, and so being that accomplice in good trouble, making sure that we can stand up uh, and truly be an, an ally, truly speak up for people is something that I aspire to be uh, and that I hope uh, that could be replicated uh, in and throughout uh, the workforce here at UCLA Health and, and, and quite frankly, in any of our workforces where we're, we're talking about allyship. I love that idea of an accomplice in good trouble. And, you know, I think that is, that's powerful. That made my, my hair stand up. Um, that's a bald joke, sorry. But no, it really <laughs> did. It, you know, it was um, powerful because I think when, when you put it, you frame it that way, it means you're, you're willing to get in the mix and you're willing to put yourself on the line along with, the people you see affected and impacted by these things. And I think it's the actions that really matter. And, you know, and that takes courage. Um, but I think as people do that more, it's easier to do that. You know, once you get a comfortable being uncomfortable and you, you're really to, willing to put your skin in the game, that's when uh, it can go a long way. Uh, I want to turn our attention a little bit to. Uh, you know, for our MHA students and graduates, how can they stay informed and knowledgeable on these topics? You know, this it's an evolving uh, diaspora of knowledge that keeps growing and changing, and there's so many events that are happening. How do they stay on top of it, both while they're in school and beyond? And Maria, I'd love your thoughts on this. As someone who's looking for talent and is cultivating talent, what are your thoughts on how, how they can stay informed and, and embrace this? I love this question. Um, it's definitely, it's one of those things where um, even in the organization and with um, finding ways to plug myself in, you know, curious about the work that's being um, done. What else can we be doing? Thinking about the individuals that are, uh, have been underrepresented. And as we look at the shift in the, the workforce, um, what's really important, and at any point through the MHA program, um, even for somebody like, like myself, 
where I've supervised and I um, throughout my career and do today, um, always thinking about bringing it back to the individual. You know, there will either you're you are a lead, you will be a supervisor, you'll be leading teams or the entire organization. And knowing that it's really important to uh, really ask the question, um, how can we make this a better place for you as an individual, but not have a one cookie cutter approach, right? The intersectionality that was discussed earlier, but meet them where they are and continue to have that conversation. Um, I think in the organizations that we all are here representing, uh, there, there are EDNI councils, there are committees, um, the roles that we all have. Um, I still think that to the, every single individual is a community member of the organization, and we want our workforce to be reflective of the communities and patients that we serve and want to continue to serve as that evolves. So I think that's really the, the mindset that I would say going in. Um, leadership, you know, I, I uh, picked up a book the other day, um, the anti-racist leadership book with um, James White, and really going back to a quote that really resonates with me throughout the weeks. I've been reading that book over and over again, but it's uh, weave DNI through the organizational fabric, so it becomes a fundamental part of how you do business. And I think that really speaks to whatever I'm doing every day of how do I just make sure that I don't lose sight of that. Um, but in times of you know busyness, all the challenges, we're trying to recruit and retain individuals. Well, but as we've gone through the last couple of years, you know, how we look at our connection to work, our purpose, you know, staying resist resilient in the moments of burnout. Um, healthcare is challenging. COVID is still here. You know, what do you um, what do you do around this phase? And I think just being, being able to talk to each other, and especially your mentors and leaders who have been in this space, um, those that are helping you um, through your journey through MHA, um, that's really important too. So kind of talk to them. Like what's been what has it been like for you the last couple of years? Um, thinking fondly of some of my classmates who are in the clinical space day in and day out. Um, it has tested their resiliency. And these are what I would say is um, those that were the epitome of you know, grit and resiliency in my book and has really tested them. And I think it's good to learn from those, those experiences and to be able to bring that to what you're doing and growing from it. I have a, a, a follow-up to that because um, you know, one thing that, that made me think about was for, for students in this environment that we're in, you know, entering the professional or even, even new professionals, Zoom, where, you know, we used to have water cooler conversations, you could connect to people and develop these relationships. How do you, how, are, how do you think people can develop a relationship with a mentor and get to know someone and learn from them in this environment? Like, what are some tactics? Sure. I would say right now, what I'm seeing as being uh, more successful for most individuals is um, being more intentional as a leader. If you are the leader, um, really being able to drive that mentorship and opportunity. Um, even as an employee, I know it's challenging in the hybrid work environment we're in today, or the business of being um, in the hospitals. Uh, being able to you know, raise your hand and say, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something a little bit different. I want to experience something that I haven't been able to experience the last couple of years. Uh, new employees starting during these hybrid remote times, it's making that connection with the communities that you want to be to, you know, what you would have imagined if you were coming on site for a new job, right? So being able to um, translate that into a digital space, what can we do? Um, I think a lot of the, uh, the shift towards Zoom, you know, Teams and other tools have allowed individuals to be more, um, more accessible um, you know, and there are times we'd have to kind of, you know, jump in the car, we're talking about attire, and <laughs> we put on, put in our clothes <laughs> for, um, to go from one location to the next. And now we can digitally um, jump from one session to another. And I think that's allowed some individuals where really access to um, being there in a physical space was more challenging. Um, and then a lot of these um, opportunities as well are recorded, which we haven't been able to do in the past. And I think it's created more of an opportunity for individuals where they just couldn't get access to this information. Yeah, They're really I, able to I, get to where they are. Yeah, I love that. I love this idea that it can actually improve access and opportunities to connect with people. Uh, you know, uh, VJ, I'm curious, EY is a global brand. You're across, you know, probably every state and multiple countries. Um, what does, what would be your advice for MA, MHA students and graduates to, to stay knowledgeable, like from your, from a global perspective, what does that look like? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, in my experience is to be bold and reach out to those that are um, different from you or you may um, may benefit from either their leadership or getting a better understanding. So um, my advice is like get involved in, in a diversity group that is of interest to you. It could be one that you identify with or one that you're, you have curiosity in and that could be within your school or when you get out, um, you know, participate in the organization's um, diversity groups. If you work for an organization that may not have those, then there's other ways to get exposure. Um, perhaps you could um, join a nonprofit uh, or volunteer with a nonprofit, um, join an email, uh, like a, a newsletter or a listserv from those respective nonprofits that push out information around what's going on in their space or opportunities to, to uh, support, uh, whether it's through volunteering or, or uh, otherwise. Other ways that we do it is we send folks to annual diversity conferences, um, not only as participants, but also uh, part of the thought leadership. Um, and, uh, and these are ways for uh, us to get folks that are curious and interested in supporting to help develop materials. You know, they may not be subject matter resources in, in those spaces, but if them, uh, you know, able to research and get more involved in creating the content, and that helps resonate. Um, with those folks. And so those are some of the ways that I've personally gotten involved. And then it's, you know, just kind of evolved from there. Um, so if your organization promotes it, great. If not, there's other ways to, to get involved um, if you don't have direct uh, um, access to it. Yeah, that's really, really a cool uh, recommendation in terms of going outside of the organization too. You know, like you can look for the groups in the organization they don't have it, volunteer, get on the lift, sir. And what's fun, I think, as a professional and someone of curiosity is these things can enliven your life. You know, like it can be something that brings you joy and, and adds value to you as a person, even if you don't identify with those populations and those groups of people. That's, you know, it, it adds to your, to your experience. I think that's really good. Uh, advice as well. I want to talk a little bit, we're going to switch gears into being a little more specific about, you know, organizationally, what are you doing and how are you speaking to these efforts? And, um, you know, Michael, we know, I, I know you have a hard stop in a, in a few minutes. So I want to give you a, a question here around, you know, what you're doing from an organizational perspective in terms of DEI and what kind of strategies are you focusing on? How are you, and how are you measuring outcomes uh, related to that work? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, and one of, one of the things we're doing is taking swift action on things when we see problems arise. And so that's, that's what I'm, I'm attending to at the moment in the background. But uh, with that, uh, I think uh, one, of, one of the things uh, that, that really uh, is resonating with a lot of people in our workforce is first that commitment. Uh, I think that we, we saw it a little bit play out in, in 2020 with the uh, social unrest is a lot of organizations making that pledge or saying, making those statements that they stand against uh, injustices. Uh, and so uh, first and foremost, what we're doing is uh, making sure that we are aware of not only the things that are happening environmentally, but the things that are happening in our organization. Um, I think that's an important part of it is just that awareness. And the next is acknowledgement, uh, acknowledging these things, the impact that they have on our staff and our people and how they affect our everyday workspaces. Those are the, the two biggest things in order to get us to action. Uh, and so the, that next step being action uh, and, and making sure that we drive uh, informed decision-making uh, and those measures uh, really being rooted in uh, several larger buckets. And so we, we have our, our workforce development efforts. We have our clinical excellence. Uh, we have our community investment, uh, and then uh, we have our just ongoing education and, and professional development. Uh, and so look at, looking at those, those buckets, uh, what we were really trying to do is make sure that our approach is comprehensive. And within those buckets,
market, uh, there are several measures uh, that we are looking to improve. Um, and uh, part of that improvement is really being a part of a community of practice and uh, and letting leaders know we're not in this alone. And so we're, we're part of a healthcare anchor network. Uh, and that's a network of healthcare organizations that are committed to driving equity and the workforce and procurement, supply chain, contracting, uh, but then also how we invest our dollars and how we drive economic uh, freedom in communities uh, as part of our economic engine as an institution. Um, the next thing, uh, we're uh, part of a cohort with uh, medical school institutions where we're transforming our medical education to make sure that we integrate anti-racism, anti-bias. Uh, and so looking at uh, those those system transformation initiatives. Uh, what we really want to do is ensure that uh, pay equity is increased, promotion opportunities uh, are enhanced, uh, pipelines are developed for our people, uh, but then also recognizing that as the data and the research shows us, as we uh, get uh, uh, stronger work as we get a stronger workforce, a more engaged workforce, our clinical outcomes improve as well. Uh, and so, just making sure uh, that uh, those traditional HR measures are we're closing the gaps there, uh, but then also we're including our community in that. So those partnerships, investment dollars, where they're where are those going? Uh, but then also, uh, how are we being very targeted? in our approach uh, and so I'll, I'll share a really cool uh, thing you know, in our community of practice that we're working on uh, is uh, targeted universalism where we focus on a specific demographic and knowing that in focusing on that specific demographic and solving problems for those most marginalized we improve uh, the the environment for everyone uh, whether that's our folks uh, living with disabilities, whether that's our LGBT community, whether that's women in our workplace and the, the pay inequities that we commonly see, whatever the case may be. Uh, and so I just wanted to make sure to share that comprehensive overview of, of the things that we're doing because it's not just the Office of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, it's our entire system. Uh, and our, our primary goal is to streamline that and then make sure that the great work that's that's being done is communicated uh, throughout the organization. Yeah, I, targeted universalism. Yeah, I can that, I can share an article about that. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, I, I I love that approach, and you know, some of the work that we've been doing is uh, very similar. I've I've not heard it called that, and so that's something that's making me want to dig a little deeper. I encourage our, our folks on the call as well to to uh, take the article that Michael shares and, and look into it because it really is about making informed data-driven decisions and um, understanding the needs of different populations. So, so you know, Kian, with your analytics background and, uh, you know, some of the work you're doing at Hartford, uh, could you talk about how you're connecting the dots from an analytical analytics perspective with the programmatic efforts that you're doing and, and how that's kind of informing your work. Absolutely. And, you know, I would say one drives the other and vice versa. Um, and, you know, what, what we're doing at Hartford Healthcare is, is just being very curious about, um, about the data. Um, but first and foremost, focusing on um, the data collection itself so we can um, you know, generate better insights about um, the disparities that exist um, in terms of clinical, in terms of experience, in terms of um, colleague health, um, feelings of, of colleague belonging. So ensuring that um, we're collecting, um, universally collecting race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, disability status, um, so we can take a deeper dive to understand um, where uh, clinical disparities exist um, within our population. Um, and also, um, in addition to the quantitative data, um, taking in qualitative data. Um, so as part of our community health needs assessment um, this year, we are um, 
essentially um, uh, inviting equity champions, individuals in the community who are able to um, to share uh, their lived experience, to share the experiences of the communities in which they live and represent. Um, and uh, what we're doing is um, kind of embedding their feedback in terms of how we think about um, community outreach, how we think about services generated or uh, rendered rather. Um, and then there's also our patient and family advisory councils. Um, and we've, we've done tremendous efforts in terms of making sure those councils are diverse and represent uh, the community. So it's taking also taking data from um, those patient family advisory councils. Um, to to drive um, programs. Um, so, you know, those patient and family advisory councils represent a number of clinical areas. Um, and, and that feedback goes to, um, to those clinical areas to improve um, services. Um, at, the last thing I would add in terms of, of data is also uh, being able to tell the story of, of that data, so not only focusing on, um, on the collection, um, but also circling back to, um, you know, why might we be seeing these disparities um, in our communities? And, um, you know, no matter how you, how you look at it, it, it goes back to systemic and institutional um, racism as an underlying driver um, for the disparities um, that we see um, in our health system and for for all hospitals and health systems. Um, so, and it, it's really centering around telling that story um, through the data. Yeah, and you, you brought up, you know, when you look at the data, systemic and institutional racism are the underlying drivers for health inequities and disparities. Unquestionably, it is so consistent. Uh, but you also brought up qualitative data. And I think that's something we don't talk enough about in healthcare is the qualitative piece. You know, how are, how are people in our organization feeling and thinking about it? What are they saying? And what are our patients in their communities and their families say? So I thought that was a really nice um, add to that is that you also want to take a deeper uh, dive, so to speak, into the experiences of people and understanding on an emotional level, what they're going through. Um, so th thank you for sharing that. I think that was really great. Michael, thank you so much for everything you've contributed to the call. And uh, we really appreciate your thought leadership in this space. And thank you all. I apologize, just putting out a, a work fire, but it was so great to be here with all of you. And I, I look forward to engaging with you all more and, and being thought partners in this work. So you all are now uh, my, my, my community in this space. Likewise, thank you. Thank you. So um, we have a, a few more questions we want to get through. Our, what's our, our check on time, Jen? Are we 15 minutes? I just want to make yeah. 17. Yeah, we give about 15 minutes and then leave any open time for Q&A at the end. Yeah. Great. So um, on, the, on the next question, I want to sort of dive into some programmatic efforts. And, you know, um, BJ would love your thoughts on some of the programmatic programmatic and strategic efforts you are a part of within your organization. Now talk a little bit about some of those things you're doing and how they tie to strategy. Yeah, so uh, just to give a little background uh, with, around EY, we've got 14 formal uh, employee resource groups that are our diversity groups. Um, and they range from race, um, uh, ethnicity, you know, uh, gender, and you know, all the above, sexual orientation. and Many of those uh, ERGs are actually formula formed at the global level, and so that it coincides with our code of conduct that we have to attest to every single year, and that EY does um, update based on the dynamics and you know uh, essentially the political uh, you know push within our organization. So just recently, our global code of conduct uh, conduct was updated with uh, age and gender. Um, which, you know, if we think about our organization, uh, that may sound like we're behind, <clears throat> but we're a global firm. 
uh, but it's made up of 100 plus member, member firms. So, you know, the U.S. firm is uh, part of the Global Alliance, as well as, you know, Saudi Arabia or Australia. And so when, if, if I were to uh, conduct work in any of those or in any of those locations, there's an expectation of those EY member, member firms uh, treat me with the same code of conduct um, across the globe. And that, that also in turn is a requirement of our clients. So before we even accept our, uh, any kind of client work, we have to go through an independent uh, uh, review to make sure that that client can meet um, our work environment requirements, even around uh, that code of conduct. Um, so we really, we really think about, you know, the risk factor um, as it relates to our people. And so some of the programmatic stuff that we do, uh, we get really involved uh, at the national, within the national level to really look at, you know, what are the priorities for that year? Um, and, and then we empower at the local level. So ways that I might get involved, uh, let's, let's use the LGBT ERG as an example, right? Um, you know, within Texas, there, um, there, there's, there tends to be, um, you know, continued pushback against LGBT in the workplace. Um, you know, bills coming up forward, so we, got, we have to do more effort within Texas around LGBT where that might not be uh, the case in maybe some other um, uh, locations within within the nation. And so we empower at the local level to uh, to do that. And the way we do it is we've created these regional based uh, DEI councils um, where we bring a, a group of representation from that um, from that loca locale and they can formulate what the priorities need to be for, for that area. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we kind of empower at the local level um, to, to make, to realize, you know, the needs of the workforce that, um, that are in those places. Yeah, this is a, a fascinating uh, perspective because I, you're looking at global differences in how DEI is defined, right? And, and who's marginalized or underrepresented is different in different countries. Um, and, and even the data we collect in different countries can be different. Um, and then the other thing is on the local political level, we just saw Disney just have their nonprofit uh, exemption status, or not nonprofit, some type of tax exemption status taken away in Florida uh, for their stance against the Don't Say Gay bill. And so there's even, you know, that's a, a political risk that they took and stood behind their employees. So. Uh, I think it's great that you're empowering um, your local uh, firms to sort of engage in that work. Um, Want to look at um, the next question for you, Maria. How does your organization bring a human-centered approach to DEI efforts? So. Uh it was mentioned earlier, but some of the qualitative work, um, really important being able to have some of our listening sessions, um, whether in the last couple of years, we've had uh, what we would call our different affinity groups, our, um, our conversations around uh, bringing allyship, anti-racism, and um, having those reoccurring so that we have an opportunity for individuals to have a safe, um, psychologically safe space to have those conversations um, with each other, but um, to be able to raise the concerns. Um, and with that, also um, with our equity dashboard that we just um, launched a few years ago, really being able to bring the data, um, you know, how are we as individuals identifying um, ourselves uh, and what are, the, what are the concerns that are getting brought up from the different employee groups? Um, our launch of our bias reporting tool um, has also allowed us to really address some of the concerns that are happening, not necessarily from our, our, our quarterly employee um, pulse surveys, but bring, being able to bring trends and the level of transparency on action that we're taking to really be able to leverage that from a, um, a strategy perspective. So what are some of the initiatives um, or some of the uh, must-dos, urgent um, items that we need to address in the near term? Uh, so it's coming down to more of uh, really being able to take the data, the conversations, what we're hearing, 
but taking action now instead of waiting until uh, we have a plan to address uh, on an annual basis. So it's been really helpful. Um, other, other opportunities, I think really being able to have those conversations locally, um, concerns around DNI uh, leaders um, have all been through the um, implicit bias training, the anti-racism uh, training, really being able to make sure that that's a priority for us and that we are addressing those um, at the local level with our teams and each of our employees. Yeah, so uh, I think it's really cool that you you all have a bias uh, reporting tool. And talk a little bit about that. Uh, what is that like? Is it anonymous? How does that help inform your work? It's 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 nice that it's actually um, been launched as an anonymous tool. Um, there are uh, key individuals and in, uh, members from our health system when it comes to our EDNI office and our council. So we're, um, and members from human resources as well. So we have an opportunity to bring an interdisciplinary approach to this. Uh, not, a, not a tool where we're thinking about, you know, is this um, something that gets reported out and comes back to the individual, but being able to really address um, any moments that can be perceived as, as um, bias, here's what's happened, here's what I want to make sure that um, as an ally, I'm reporting to see if this is what could have happened there. Very similar to in the healthcare setting where we see a patient safety reporting, right? Where there could have been a, a missed opportunity, could have been a fall, but let's have another eye on this so that we can look at this as a opportunity for systemic change. Um, I think it was a framework that would really support us um, being able to address this proactively instead of waiting um, for the, the trends to happen or being able to trust, uh, address this after the fact. So it's allowed us to be a little bit more um, in just in time, addressing some of the concerns that are happening um, with the bias reporting. Um, we've, we saw a huge um, response when we first launched the bias reporting tool. So it's great to see that it's there. Um, we're continuing to respond to those and report back out on um, what we're doing to take action. And of course, making sure that the voices are heard and it's not just a tool that's just um, off to the side that we're looking at just data. Yeah, that's, I think opening up those lines of communication between employees and the organization so you can really understand in real time what's happening and address it, work to address it. Because, you know, the annual surveys we do don't always get to some of those microaggressions and in moments where you, you need to share, you need to talk about it. And, um, you know, you, you, you don't want to um, to Kiana's point earlier, face retaliation or, you know, all these other things. So that's, I think that's a great mechanism. Um, given our sort of, um, we have about seven minutes left and one big question I want to ask each of you. And that is really around, um, you know, the last couple of years have been just, uh, you know, really challenging for everyone. Uh, but in particular, I think uh, DEI as a function within healthcare has also had a very heavy lift. And I would love to hear your thoughts, each of you, on how you feel the pandemic has affected inclusivity in the workplace, how it's affected professionalism, how it's affected allyship, and, and even our progress um, towards equity. And, and how, has it, how has equity been redefined over the last couple of years because it's you know, so much has happened in a very short amount of time. Um, so yeah, I'll just throw that out. I'd love for each of you. Uh, BJ? I yeah, sure. You. Sure, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I, I've I been at EY for 10 years and part of, part of that has been the pride around um, EY being at the forefront of a lot of the diversity and inclusion um, you know, when we look at a lot of the, the corporations that are leading in this space, I think the pandemic really opened our eyes to there's more that we could do. If you looked at our workforce a couple of years ago, it was not representative of our population, um, especially at the more senior level. Um, and so what really action for us is that what kind of uh, catalyzed for us is that we had various unplugged uh, conversations where they were very raw, where we could ask questions of various groups, whether it was Pan-Asian, whether it was the Black community, 
uh, you know, the LGBT community and just being a listener on these forums to hear about, um, you know, my colleagues, my team members, you know, experiences either growing up, going through college, their work environment, um, and, um, you know, and in some instances, you know, client interactions um, was very humbling. And so some of the things that we've done over the last couple of years um, around some themes are how do we beef up our internal, um, you know, uh, DEI um, offerings, whether that's additional investments in uh, individuals getting more exposure to it at the ground level, you know, going through, going to more um, conferences, um, you know, allow, allowing for more time for individuals to volunteer or take time off to, uh, to go out into the community and serve them. So we have pushed a program called EY Ripples that, that um, allows us to enact some of these things at the ground level. And we can go to an internal platform to see what those opportunities are um, within our own communities. That's one. Another area was our recruiting pipeline. You know, we traditionally were recruiting from, uh, you know, specific schools. Uh, and those schools uh, more or less may, uh, you know, may not represent um, our, our U.S. populations. And so we had to look hard at what schools we were recruiting from and develop a distinct pipeline. And so we, you know, we went out to those uh, schools that, you know, historically black uh, colleges. Um, and then we've also developed a specific diversity pipelines where, um, you know, we will go to the national conferences and um, look for individuals that are interested in consulting across our various service lines. Um, and, and we've really poured in a lot of resources to um, kind of build up our um, recruiting pipeline. And then the third area is getting involved in the community, right? So um, what, one of the things that we've heard um, is education at the elementary and middle school level um, is what's needed for um, um, marginalized communities, whether it's socioeconomic or um, specific race backgrounds. Uh, they just don't have exposure to some of the professional service um, backgrounds and, and, you know, what it takes to qualify. They just don't ha have um, exposure to those types of uh, work opportunities. And so we need to get in at the ground. And so that's the push um, we've done. And, and, you know, I think the biggest benefit is got us to, to speak up and to have these candid conversations. And I think that has um, developed a lot more trust internally. There's a lot more transparency in what's going on. We're seeing a lot more, um, you know, email traffic, notification traffic from our senior leaderships addressing these, uh, you know, tip, typically what would be seen as, you know, uh, avoided topics. And really appreciate that our leadership is opening, you know, more to have these dialogues that once was considered taboo. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, leadership uh, providing those opportunities to have those conversations and then also the, um, the investment dollars to back up um, has made a considerable difference. Yeah, it sounds like a very engaging process when you have, you know, put money where your mouth is uh, and you can make a lot of progress. So kudos to um, EY for doing that. Uh, Kian, how... How about you? How has, uh, you know, the pandemic affected your efforts in, in, the, in the work that you're leading? Yeah, uh, you know, I would say it's certainly accelerated the work. Um, just for context, health equity as a department was created uh, toward the end of 2019. Um, so right before the pandemic, we had just wrapped up our um, kind of roadmap or strategic analysis of uh, where we were current state and where we wanted to go. And uh, the pandemic kind of threw all of that out of the window. Um, and we saw our organization really um, center um, health equity, uh, diversity and inclusion, and, and put it at the forefront in terms of it being foundational to what the organization does. Um, and transitioning from just thinking about equity as that ultimate outcome um, to thinking about equity in processes. Um, so with, with testing, with vaccinations, um, uh, as it related to colleague engagement and resilience during the pandemic, 
um, it was um, really equity centered. And, um, you know, to add on to that, we, we started out as just the health equity department. And um, after 2020, um, you know, following uh, massive and, and almost universal calls for, um, for racial equity and racial justice, uh, rapidly expanded the scope to health equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and um, added health equity to our organization's um, balanced scorecard, and added equity as a value um, for our organization. So making sure that um, you know we're uplifting, um, doing the just thing. And I can say in, in 2019, our strategic plan did not include um, you know adding equity as a value. Um, so just the level of commitment um, over the past uh, two years um, was really um, kind of unprecedented for Hartford Healthcare from our, our CEO um, you know, on down to um, all of our staff across the organization. So it, um, again, the pandemic uh, accelerated the work it, and elevated the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, that's great news that, you know, so, sometimes uh, there's an opportunity within tragedy and it sounds like your, your system has been able to, to do that. Um, last final thoughts on that, uh, Maria? So I think very similar to BJ and Keon, uh, the last two years, um, of course, in Washington State, we were the, one of the first uh, reporting of the COVID case here in this country. And um, with UW Medicine and Harborview Medical Center, particularly as a regional um, disaster center, um, really being able to respond and look at the populations where we just really couldn't. Um, we know that testing was important, but we knew that individuals could not make their way to our hospital facilities. But with our um, EDNI leaders, really being able to look at, you know, we need to go out to the community. Where are the individuals and they can't get to where we are in providing vaccinations or getting tested? So that really got us to think about, you know, the data, um, drilling into not just the numbers, but where are the underserved populations and the marginalized. Um, from the recruiting standpoint, we are in the great resignation right now, uh, the great re realignment. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing, but really acceler accelerated and uh, really pushed forward on is looking at easier access points with our network of other healthcare organizations and our schools and the communities and really driving policy here in this state. Um, thinking about the roles when it comes to what are the, um, the opportunities for apprenticeships, internships, career pathways that are easier to get into as we've you know, all seen individuals need to take a step back from additional education or be able to juggle life as it is right now with the uncertainties in day to day. So that's been an investment and a priority and also a reason why my role also shifted in the organization to focus on workforce planning to help build out some of those opportunities and career paths that make it easier for individuals to um, really uh, move their livable wage um, and progress there and create the better opportunities for them to eventually um, bring more individuals from low income, BIPOC, first generation, all the different populations that we know we want more represented in um, all the different levels within the organization. Uh, yeah, that's great. And boy, have you had your hands full of, in town acquisition. <laughs> uh, you know, you had everything that's going on with the great resignation, burnout, opportunity. <laughs> yeah. um, you have to be dynamic and you have to really think about it long term. And I, I, I appreciate your thoughts on workforce planning and how do we how do we help people level up within the organization and drive representation at all levels of organization I think that's key uh, and for healthcare, you know one of the things that that means is better patient outcomes the more we look like our communities the better their outcomes are so uh, it's what you're doing is critically important to the health equity goals as well so thank you for sharing that um, I think we are at time for our panel discussion and now we have uh, maybe q a or um, uh, 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 networking session. So, Jen? Yeah, so if anyone wants to um, put questions into the chat, we'll kind of wait a few minutes for, for those to roll in. Um, but thank you all for um, the conversation so far. 
Um, if we don't get any questions into the chat, um, happy to move on to our networking session, but I'll give folks a few minutes to kind of put those in. And, and while we're waiting on that, I just want to thank the, the panelists. Um, you all really provide such uh, tremendous insights and leadership and, and thoughts into the space. You've made me think um, and given me new ideas. So kudos to you and the work you're doing. It's really important. And I know it's heavy. I know it's hard. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm so happy that that you were able to share your thoughts with us today. Thank you. Well, I would like to echo those thanks. Um, we had a, an exceptional panel and we, and just so that you all know, we had close to 60 people registered. So we had a little smaller showing than we anticipated this afternoon. A little bit challenging when we have folks from all different time zones to figure out the right time of day that's gonna work for everyone. Um, but glad that we uh, have been able to record this session so we can make it available. Um, so um, Jen, since I don't see any questions coming up, do you wanna go ahead and put the, um, can we go ahead and start the other breakout group earlier and just invite everyone into that? It actually looks like we do have one question that came in. Oh, good. Just right now. Okay, good. Excellent. This is a great question. It says, and I um, would love for anyone on the panel to, to jump in. How do you manage all your identities? As a gay Latino, I struggle with navigating all the issues happening between all of my identities. How do you feel like you are doing enough? Um, so I, that's that's a really great question, and um, you know, I, I guess there's two ways to to kind of go about this. One is thinking about, um, you know, how do you bring your full self um, to to work or wherever you are, um, and and I guess the second way that I that I'm thinking about this question is, um, you know, at times are are there times when there is one identity um, that might be, um, I wouldn't say more important, but more kind of visible depending on the environment that you're in, or that is is more. Uh, more more leverage, I guess. Um, and I, I I would say my tendency would be uh, on that first um, the first part of my answer is um, you know ensuring you're bringing your full self and um, making sure that you're in an environment where your full self is um, is welcomed and included and respected. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're in a position where you're in a work environment and your identities are not being um, welcomed or you feel as if you can't be your full self, um, you know, that's, that's an opportunity to then um, either you know, speak up or connect with the individuals in your organization. And if your organization culture does not um, welcome all of your identities, um, you know, un unfortunately, um, you know, you have to find an organization that is welcoming. And the good news is there are so many um, organizations that are um, that are welcoming of of all of your um, identities, whether it be um, gender, uh, race, ethnicity. Um, your nationality, um, your um, your religious identity, um, et cetera. One thing I would add to that is just giving yourself the grace that um, you're bringing your whole self, 
um, and you bring a, um, a lot of identities and groups that you represent as an individual or through lived experiences. So um, I mentioned there's sometimes where there may be that one um, voice that um, resonates more with the community that you're speaking with, or there may be others who also bring um, the different identities and voices that you want to uh, make sure uh, that voice is addressed from the community. So I think uh, uh, I share with a lot of individuals many times is, you know, sometimes and I tell myself this as well as I have to give myself the grace and compassion and know that I cannot be always right. I'm still learning. I've got my learning curve. Um, and at some point I might be pulling from one identity over another in a conversation. I, I, I think that um, there, grace is so important and also to know that you are doing that. Just by being, just by showing up, you are enough. And, you know, uh, giving yourself compassion and love and rest is so important right now. I can't even stress that enough that as much as you can rest your soul, rest your body, rest your mind, take advantage of that because that will help you show up as your fullest self. And um, Maria and Kian both had great, great advice. Uh, as well, and I think that can go a long ways uh, in today's environment. So, um. the the other thing that I would add uh, quickly is, um, you know, find find your community, um, the community that's going to um, support you and embrace you. Yeah, that that it should be like I think the mantra for. For, you know, uh, find your community that have those shoulders to lean on and to cry on and to hold you up and to help each other because that is uh, that's great advice, Kian. Great, great advice. Are there any other questions before we? Um, head to the networking event. And it looks like we have a, another Zoom link for that. So we will jump off of this call in a, a few moments and head into the, to the networking event.